Welcome to your midweek edition of CNN 10. My name is Carl Azus, broadcasting from a remote location outside the CNN Center. We're thankful as always to have you watching. A group of American medical advisors met on Tuesday to make a challenging call. Once a coronavirus vaccine gets approved and becomes available, what groups will be the first to have access to it? Vaccines are already available in Russia. China is getting close to distributing one, as you're about to hear. And in the United States, two pharmaceutical companies have applied to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to get its authorization for their vaccines. The Trump administration has a program called Operation Warp Speed. Its goal is to rapidly produce and distribute hundreds of millions of vaccines once they're approved. But though that approval is expected to come in the middle of this month, the number of shots that are actually available will likely be limited until next spring. And some of those who may want the vaccine may not be able to get it until then. So the advisors who met Tuesday were trying to help the Centers for Disease Control prioritize who'd have access to the shot first. Would this be healthcare workers and residents of nursing homes? Would it be essential workers like police officers and firefighters or people with underlying medical conditions? Medical experts say cancer, diabetes, heart conditions, obesity, and kidney or liver disease can make coronavirus symptoms more dangerous. That's part of the reason why it's such a challenge to decide who gets access to the vaccine. Officials say as many as 40% of people who contract coronavirus have no symptoms at all, and more than 99% of those who catch it are estimated to survive. Still, the race to develop a vaccine extends far beyond the United States, and the challenges of distributing one extend to every part of the world. You're looking at one of the cargo jets that will soon be taking vaccines that are approved here in China, made by Chinese biotech companies, to the rest of the world. This one is a charter, Ethiopian cargo. It's their pharma wing. Look over here, you can see they're already loading up some of the PPE, some of the face masks, some of the hazmat-like suits. Inside, however, they have built an infrastructure that is temperature and climate controlled. Why does that matter? Well, as soon as the vaccines are approved, they have to be kept at a certain temperature setting. And that is the only way they can be transferred from start here in Shenzhen in southern China to finish. For this aircraft, it continues on to the Middle East. One thing that's important to note is the logo on the side, Thai now. That is a part of Alibaba. It's their logistics and distribution part. Normally they're doing goods that people are buying online. Think of Amazon, but on a massive scale. That is the company that here in China is helping with the distribution of vaccines as soon as they're given the go ahead. We are ready to move the vaccines. Sinel CEO Wan Lin says the company is now adding more routes for greater global reach. We are not still quite sure about uh, uh, the exact demand on that, but we are definitely building our capability to be prepared for that. While China is yet to approve a vaccine for public use, Sinel says their end-to-end climate-controlled infrastructure is in place and ready. The required temperature, which differs depending on the vaccine, must be maintained throughout transport, from leaving the production facility to airport storage, and finally, to global cargo distribution. For example, the uh, Shenzhen Airport Terminal, they have already set up a cold chain warehouse, uh, 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 mainly for the medicine suppliers. CNN got an exclusive look inside that cold chain facility, which will soon store the approved vaccines. Now, these chambers can be specified and even customized based on the required temperature for each vaccine. And they can put them in different chambers within so as to accommodate that. Sinal then works with different airlines to ensure the cargo temperature is sustained throughout the flight. In this case, Ethiopian Airlines. Since the start of the pandemic, they've flown more than 3,000 tons of supplies to Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and South America. So we do the same also for the vaccine to distribute to all uh, destinations around the globe, and then we can cure a lot of human beings. Ten-second trivia. The shoulder hump of a grizzly bear consists of what? Bone, muscle, fat, or cartilage? Though the hump of a camel is made of fat, it's muscle that gives grizzly bears the rise in their shoulders. Facial recognition technology and its related controversies aren't just for humans anymore. 
A biologist and two technology workers have teamed up to create Bear ID. It uses facial recognition software to monitor grizzly bears. How? By comparing the measurements of their different facial features. Why? To track them without having to attach a collar or electronic tag. How accurate is it? Bear ID says it's 84% accurate, but only for the bears that are already in its relatively small database. Why is this controversial? If poachers get access to this info, they could use it to hunt down the animals illegally. These obviously aren't the same kinds of concerns as there are for human facial recognition software like Clearview AI. It's one company that collects pictures from Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and saves them even after accounts have been deleted. Critics call this an invasion of privacy. The company says it can help police identify crime suspects, though some departments have pulled away from Clearview in favor of their own databases. Wow, oh my God. Is that you? That or photo th is me. Doesn't yes. look like you, that's when you were younger? That's my face, a photo I haven't seen in years, found in seconds by the facial recognition app Clearview AI. So it works, right? This New York Times investigation woke us all up. The realization, privacy may be a thing of the past. And that's because of this guy, Wonton Tat, the creator of Clearview AI. Well, quite simply, Clearview is basically a search engine for faces. Think about the photos you've posted online, or photos that others have posted of you. There's a good chance he's collected them. His app has scraped billions of images from sites like Facebook, Twitter, and Google to use in a facial recognition system. He claims more than 600 law enforcement agencies in the US and Canada are using it, though it's unclear how many have actually paid for it. So that's the photo of you. So this is a, a photo of me from CNN.com. Wow. <laughs> We're starting to see pictures of me that are not from that original image. This is from Medium. Tech giants aren't happy about this. They say it violates their terms of service and have sent cease and desist letters. This AI technology is looking at what it's looking the at. The unique features, so it learns to ignore things a little bit like the beard and f focus on the features that stay the same across uh, you know, different age. Do you understand why people find this creepy? I can understand people having concerns around privacy. So the first part to remember, it's only publicly available information. We're not just making technology for its own sake. The reason and the purpose we found is to really help law enforcement solve crime. I was deeply disturbed. I was concerned about how Clearview had amassed its database of images. I was concerned about its data privacy, and I was concerned that it was tracking law enforcement searches. Are you concerned about taking a tool as powerful as that out of the hands of law enforcement? A facial recognition tool can be used properly if we understand how the database is created. Clearview claims its app is 99% accurate, a claim that CNN hasn't verified. So you think this is an area that should be regulated? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think regulation is a bad thing, and we want to work with the government to create something that is uh, safe and understandable and keeps uh, the whole public at ease. For 10 out of 10, the mystery of the missing monolith. November 18th, a Department of Public Safety helicopter crew is counting bighorn sheep in southeastern Utah. They discover a mysterious object standing about 10 to 12 feet high. No one knows who put it there or why. The crew leave it as they find it. And though they don't share its location, some intrepid explorers make their way out to the desert to see it for themselves. Then, the night of November 27th, the monolith is mysteriously removed and replaced by rocks. But that same weekend, a similar looking monolith appears in eastern Romania. Hey, it's 2020! Add that to the monolist of things that no one saw coming or going. Figuring this one out is going to be a monumental task. We'll have to put it in the Unsolved Mysteries column. Sure, some may pillory that idea, but what is this statue of limitations on a monolithery? It's not like it's set in stone. <laughs> All right, hey, we are going to Bordentown, New Jersey today. That's where the students and staff of Bordentown Regional High School are watching. They are also subscribing and commenting on our YouTube channel, and that is the only place where our staff looks for shout-out requests. I'm Coral Azus for CNN.